Many of them Order. within a Senator week. Senator Sheldon, you... you will be in continuation when debate resumes. Questions without notice. Senator Wong. Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for, to the Minister for Trade and Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Birmingham. I refer to alarming reports that Chinese authorities have taken the unilateral decision to ban some Australian exports. Can the minister advise the Senate of the total value of exports to China and how many Australian jobs rely on that market? The Minister for Trade, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Wong for her question, a question that is on a topic of significant importance to Australia, to many Australian industries and to the jobs of many Australians. China is Australia's number one trading partner. It's an important trading partner with whom we value what has been a long-standing relationship of mutual benefit to both of our economies. In terms of current estimates around trade volumes, the value of those volumes and uh, the jobs associated, I'll happily come back to the chamber with details on those, Senator Wong, of up-to-date estimates. But it is of, uh, of great consequence, as I've noted, that our number one trading partner has seen during the course of this year a number of decisions that it has taken that are of adverse potential consequence to Australian industry. As a government, we have been very clear in our disappointment of decisions in relation to Australia's barley growers that have seen China put in place tariffs, which we don't believe are justified. Australia's farming sector in no way is subsidised by a government or dumps its product on foreign markets such as China, nor do we believe that the decisions in relation to the specific um, actions of China when it comes uh, to the suspension of certain meat processing facilities uh, are justified for the length of time that it has taken. And we are concerned in terms of length of time that now we see decisions in relation to the processing of live seafood taking longer than should be the case. However, we equally see many rumours, stories and areas of speculation that prove to be unfounded, and so suggestions of complete outright bans on Australian trade entering China do not appear to have materialised over recent days, but we continue to work through diplomatic and administrative channels to make sure that Australian exporters get answers where they can Order, and Senator access Birmingham. where they ought. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Has the minister made direct representations to his counterpart, and if not, why not? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, I have written to my counterpart on a number of occasions about a number of the issues that I just outlined. In doing so, in doing so, we have also made representations, in addition to those written ones that I have made, as is publicly known, seeking ministerial dialogue. And it is a disappointment to Australia that, despite our willingness to sit down and engage as a mature partner in ministerial dialogue, China has been unwilling to reciprocate in that regard. Nonetheless, we retain a position and a posture of keeping the door open in that regard, and we will continue to ensure that invitation is extended and our willingness to do so is there. In addition to those representations that I have made directly, as a government, we have continued through ambassadorial level and at other diplomatic levels to engage solidly, steadfastly to try to resolve the various technical issues and other issues as well as to support Australian industry wherever we possibly Order. can. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Can the minister provide any assurance whatsoever to Australian exporters to China and all those Australians whose job rely on these exports that these exports will not be blocked upon arrival? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, that really is a question for China. I note that Chinese authorities have denied the suggestions of there being an outright ban in relation to certain export products from Australia being allowed to enter China. They have made those denials both in private and in public through their media spokespeople. I note, as I said in the answer to the primary question, that we have seen over the course of the last few days shipments in a number of areas still proceed through customs. And we hope to see that that continues, that China, in being true to their word that they have given publicly and privately that there is not such an intervention, does continue to allow trade to flow in accordance with the commitments that China has made under the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, in accordance with the commitments that China has made as a member of the World Trade Organisation. Trade between our two nations is beneficial to people across both our nations, 
and across our region. It's beneficial to people and businesses within China as well, and any disruption Order. will harm them Senator as much Birmingham. as it will. Before I call you Senator Fawcett, I just say I know I speak on behalf of all senators to say we are pleased to have been able to reopen the building and welcome Australians back to their parliament in person. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Order. minister outline to the Senate the importance of Australia's enduring alliance with the United States of America, particularly in the Indo-Pacific? Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I ask, uh, thanks, Senator Fawcett, very much for uh, asking that question. Uh, Mr. President, Australia has congratulated President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris on their victory in Order. the United States election, drawing friends and partners of the United States from around the world. Mr President, this was always going to be a strongly contested election, and we congratulate Order, the Senators American Watt people on what was ultimately a smooth, calm and extremely well-attended process. Order. It speaks to both the vigour of the American democracy that not only the uh, ticket of uh, then Vice President Biden, but also the President Trump and Vice President Pence ticket attracted more votes than any previous candidates in US history. While President-elect Biden is, of course, yet to announce his administration, we know both uh, President-elect Biden and his team well, including from the previous government of four years ago. Mr. President, the United States has been the linchpin of peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific since yeah. 1945. It has helped to provide the basis for the rules-based international order that has ensured for so many decades that the vast majority of disputes are resolved peacefully through rules rather than through conflict. As one of the United States' closest allies, Australia is a proud contributor to the stability that this system has sustained. We are confident that, through continued US engagement in the Indo-Pacific, along with increasing engagement and cooperation from other countries that share the same vision for our region, we can all continue to enjoy the benefits of an Indo-Pacific that is free and open, in which might does not equal right, and in which all countries, large and small, can pursue their interests free from coercion. Yeah. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can the minister outline how the Australian government uh, will work with the US administration from the 20th of January next year to continue promoting an Indo-Pacific region that is free, open, and prosperous? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. The Australia-US relationship is built on shared democratic values. We have worked well with the Trump administration, further illustrated by our successful Osmin talks in July, and we will do so. Uh, until Inauguration Day on 20 January. We look forward to continuing that work with the administration of President-elect Biden. Mr. President, this pandemic has wrought economic pain across our region. It's exacerbated strategic challenges that Australia and the US can help to address together. Australia and the United States are cooperating in many areas, including on health security, on countering disinformation, on resilient supply chains, on open trade as we emerge from the pandemic and supporting partners' economic recovery through targeted infrastructure development. We believe in a region in which human rights are respected, the seas and skies are open and trade and, co and commerce can flourish unimpeded. Senator Fawcett, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Could the minister update the Senate on the government's further objectives for this bilateral relationship? Senator Payne. Mr President, we look forward to working with the administration of President-elect Biden on a range of our shared priorities for the Indo-Pacific. Together with Japan, we've recently announced the first project under our trilateral infrastructure partnership in the form of an undersea internet cable to Palau, supporting economic recovery through quality infrastructure. As a signatory to the Paris Agreement, Australia looks forward to deepening cooperation with the US on technology that creates jobs and reduces emissions, consistent with our low emissions technology investment roadmap. We will continue to progress the work we've done with partnerships such as the Quad, made up of Australia, the United States, India and Japan, to maintain a region that is governed by rules, not power. No country is more important to Australia than the United States, and it's never been more vital that we stand together. 
Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. During a Senate inquiry into issues affecting diaspora communities in Australia, Senator Abetz demanded that Australians of Chinese heritage, and I quote, unconditionally condemn the Chinese Communist Party dictatorship. Does the minister support Senator Abetz's treatment of Australians of Chinese heritage? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Ayres for his question. Uh, this matter was discussed in the estimates hearing, as Senator Ayres said. I made clear my views at the time. The pledge that this government believes people should make in Australia is to Australia. Yeah. That is a clear and consistent position taken both by the Prime Minister, members of the Cabinet and members of the government. In, in terms of the comments made, that, uh, the comments that Senator Ayres has referred to, I have also indicated that Australia is the bastion of robust democracy on any interpretation, and there will be views expressed with which people agree and disagree, Mr President. But most importantly, I will defend the right of people to talk about issues Order. that are matters of concern and interest to them across the parliament, Mr President. And anyone who tries to Order. pretend that this is only an issue apparently for one side of the parliament is either delusional or deceptive. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Order. Order. The Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has outlined the ways in which Australia's national interest is undermined by statements that can be used to portray Australia as intolerant, divided and discriminatory to various groups within our society. Order. Does the minister think Senator, Senator Abetz's comments could be used to portray Australia as intolerant, divided and discriminatory and therefore undermine our national interest? Senator Payne. President, I encourage all Australians to make contributions to public discourse that contribute to cohesion, that contribute to the broad participation of all elements of the Australian communities, including di the diasporas that are so richly represented in this country and on both sides of politics, Mr President. Order. Senator Ayres, a final supplementary question. Why on earth has the government refused to condemn Senator Abetz's conduct which is divisive at home and damaging internationally. Senator Payne. Mr President, my views were carefully put on the record and clearly put on the record in Senate estimates. I have reiterated them here now. And Mr President, I wish that those opposite would in fact endeavour at some stage, somewhere, sometime, to make a constructive contribution to this discussion. Yeah. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Small business is the engine room of our economy, with over 600,000 small businesses in my home state of Queensland and nationally employing approximately 6 million Australians. Can the Minister please inform the Senate how the Morrison government's 2020 21 budget is delivering an Australian response to the COVID 19 pandemic and recession by making crucial investments to support small businesses to invest? grow and employ more Australians. The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator McGrath for his question. Uh, and Senator McGrath, as you'd be aware, uh, small and family businesses, they are the backbone of the Australian economy. And that is why the Morrison government backs them every step of the way. Uh, and certainly they have been greatly impacted by COVID-19. Uh, but that is also why the budget in 2020-2021 is a budget that firmly invests in our small businesses in Australia. Our $74 billion job maker plan, Mr President, puts small and family businesses at the heart of our economic recovery because they are the job makers in this country. And what we're doing as a government is we are continuing to put in place incentives for small businesses to prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians, programs to help them to innovate, because what has COVID-19 shown? Small businesses, they must have that ability to innovate, to survive, and of course, reforms to make it easier for small businesses to do business. We're also incentivising small businesses to invest 
and employ through investments that minimise risk. And of course, we've implemented there the introduction of the temporary full expensing and, of course, the temporary loss carryback. And Mr. President, we've also put in place wage subsidies because we want small businesses out there to be able to bring on new Australians into the workforce. We've put in place around $5.2 billion in wage subsidies. And of course, including helping small businesses to take on their first apprentice. That is just so important. Or alternatively, giving a young person the chance to return to the workforce. And Mr. President, our extension of the small business tax concessions to around 20,000 small businesses will also remove disincentives for them to actually invest in training in their current workforce. As I've said, they are the backbone of the Australian economy and the Morrison government will Order. always back them Senator every Cash. step of the Senator way. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Thank you. How does this build on the coalition government's strong record of assisting Australia's small businesses to invest, employ more Australians and pay less tax since 2013? Senator Cash. And that's right, Mr. President. This is a government that, since the day that we were elected back in 2013, has continued to put in place that policy framework to allow our small and family businesses across Australia to prosper, to grow, and to create more jobs for Australians. They are the backbone of the Australian economy. The Coalition has a strong record for delivering policies that assist small businesses to grow and to employ more Australians. One of those policies, of course, is fast-tracking tax relief. Tax relief for small and medium businesses so that they can invest and create more jobs. We know that if they can take back a bit of that money that they've paid to the government, they will invest it back into their business. Improving small business access to finance so that they can access the money they need again to invest back into their business, to grow it and create more jobs for Australians. And importantly, ensuring that they are paid on time. Cash flow is king for small businesses and that's why Order. we're ensuring Senator they're paid Cash. on time. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, why is putting in place the reforms, incentives and programs to, to support small business essential to economic recovery and job creation. Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, that is because the government understands that it's small and family businesses who are out there creating jobs. The government puts in place the policy framework that businesses can lever off to prosper, to grow and to create more jobs for Australians. And that's why we back small and family businesses every step of the way, because they are the key to Australia's recovery from COVID-19 and to our future economic prosperity. If you look at Australia's small businesses, 3.5 million small businesses. They make up almost 97.4 per cent of all businesses and they contribute 32 per cent of all private sector economic output. But on top of that, they are the great employers of our nation, employing now around 6 million Australians. They are, in fact, one of our biggest employers in Australia. We also back them, though, because we know they work tirelessly and they deserve a government that backs them. Order. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Investment and Leader of the Government, Minister Birmingham. With Trump going and US President-elect Biden saying, and I quote, climate change poses an existential threat to our future and we are running out of time to address it, end quote, Australia has more in common with petrostates like Saudi Arabia and Russia. Your targets have Australia on track for a catastrophic four degrees of warming. Will the government acknowledge that 2030 commitments are crucial and lift our targets at the upcoming Glasgow Climate Summit. The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Waters for her question. And, and indeed, I do acknowledge that 2030 targets are crucial. This side of the chamber has a 2030 target. That side of the chamber does not have a 2030 ah, target, I would note. And so, uh, so I certainly agree, Mr President, that 2030 yeah. targets are crucial and that yes. our government has outlined a 2030 target very clearly of a 26 to 28 per cent reduction against 2005 levels. And I think it's instructive, Mr President, for us to look at how it is that Australia compares when it comes indeed to our achievement of emissions reduction compared with 2005 levels. Because in Australia, our emissions are down 14 per cent compared with 2005 levels. What's the OECD average by comparison? 
It's 9 per cent. So Australia, 14 per cent. The OECD average, 9 per cent. Indeed, across a number of other countries, the United States, they're down 10 per cent, smidgen above the OECD average, uh, even including during President Trump's uh, time in office as Senator Waters. Canada, they're down 0.1 per cent. New Zealand, they're down 1 per cent. Japan's down 8 per cent. Different countries are tracking in different levels in terms of emissions reduction. But Australia can be proud of the fact that we have made commitments in Kyoto 1, in Kyoto 2, and we've exceeded those commitments in Kyoto 1 and Kyoto 2. And in exceeding those commitments, we have well and truly exceeded the OECD average for emissions reduction over that period of time. And so when our government makes a 2030 commitment, as we have done in the Paris Agreement, what we've done is commit once again to actually achieve, to achieve and ideally to exceed, as we have done time and time before. That's the approach we've taken in our time in office, to make commitments, to honour them through domestic emissions reductions, which we've done above the global average, and in getting those reductions, we intend to continue to honour our commitments. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Yes, thanks, President. Biden has pledged 100 per cent clean energy by 2035. Will this government follow suit? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr. President, uh, President-elect Biden has, uh, has made certain policy commitments, and we welcome the fact that President-elect Biden has committed to invest heavily in technology. It's very consistent with the technology roadmap that our government has outlined in terms of meeting our emissions reduction. And the United States is Australia's number one investment partner. So the complementarity that comes with them having technological ambitions alongside our technology ambitions absolutely sits well together. In terms of energy generation, which Senator Waters asked about, well, let me again look at the share of solar and wind as part of electricity generation. In Australia, solar and wind now stands at 18 per cent of electricity generation here, compared to the OECD average of 11 per cent. In the US, it's 9 per cent, Canada 6 per cent, New Zealand 5 per cent, Japan 8 per cent. So again, Australia leads in terms of renewables, solar order, and wind. Sorry, sorry. Point of order, Senator Waters. I mean, time for the answers expired. So. I think there were still three seconds on the clock, Pros, which is why I stood up, but I'm sorry if I got that wrong. Uh, it was a point of order on relevance. My question went to 100 per cent clean electricity by 2035. The, the, the minister has given the, a nice Senator little Waters, lecture, even if there, but I'm interested respect, in an did, actual answer. Senator Waters, I think you did stand when there were two seconds left, but with respect, there's no opportunity for me to provide advice to the minister. I will say, however, that I believe he was being directly relevant because the question referenced renewable energy and he was directly talking about that topic, even if not in the terms you wished. I can't instruct him how to answer a question. A final supplementary. Thanks, President. I note that former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull described your gas-led recovery as BS and political piffle. Will you now follow Malcolm Turnbull's advice and execute a pivot on climate and lead this nation towards zero emissions? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr President, gas has been a crucial transition fuel that has enabled Australia to drive down our emissions. Indeed, it's been a key factor in what's enabled the United States to drive down their emissions as well. And so gas continues to play a critical role in that energy generation sector in driving down emissions as a share of the energy generated, but it is also critically an important component for manufacturing Order. sectors as well. Manufacturing industries also need gas as an input. So when we talk about gas as an input into the Australian economy, it's not just for energy generation purposes. It is recognising that if you want a manufacturing industry in this country, if you want high employment levels in this country, then indeed you need to make sure that all of the energy resources they need that are not just electricity generation are supplied for them in that regard. And so generating gas is an important part of that. Of course, it is sitting alongside our technology roadmap and all of the other instruments that are designed to ensure Australia Order. keeps meeting Senator and Birmingham, exceeding our emission reduction targets. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Last week, it was revealed after a year-long investigation, former Liberal candidate Mr. Di Sung Duong was charged on, with preparing a foreign interference offence, the first charge laid, laid under the foreign interference laws.
Minister Tudge appeared mis with Mr. Duong at a media event at the Melbourne Hospital in June. How is it that Minister Tudge, part of the Home Affairs portfolio, was not advised against the appearance, despite it being approximately eight months into the investigation by the Counter Foreign Interference Task Force, led by the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation and the AFP? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Keneally uh, for the question. Uh, I do note that. Uh, the first opposition question of the day came to me and uh, was about sensitivities in the trade relationship. The second opposition question of the day went to Senator Payne and was about uh, indeed the conduct of, uh, of comments and how they are handled in relation to, uh, to this place. This, uh, this is quite a sensitive matter that Senator Keneally has asked a question about. Uh, I am surprised uh, that she would raise it in the chamber in this way. Nonetheless, uh, I can confirm that the AFP has charged a 65-year-old Melbourne man uh, with offences. In relation to what briefings occurred with government ministers in the conduct of any such investigations, I'll take the question on notice, Senator Keneally. Uh, I think, Mr President, uh, people would expect that AFP investigations uh, are handled sensitively, confidentially, carefully. Uh, and indeed uh, that actions of government ministers uh, during the course of those investigations also need to be uh, given appropriate, careful conduct. And so, Mr President, we'll come back uh, with any information that can appropriately be provided to Senator Keneally uh, without it, uh, it jeopardising in any way uh, the type of actions that do now find themselves before the court. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Yesterday, Mr Duong resigned from the Liberal Party before the party acted to suspend him. What action has the Prime Minister taken to ensure no member of his government has been compromised as a result of foreign interference charges against a member of the, of the party he leads? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, the government and the Prime Minister receive his briefings uh, from national security agencies as is appropriate. Uh, of course, those briefings are provided to the government as national security briefings that should be handled carefully uh, and, by and large, in confidence. Now, the opposition, through certain processes of the parliament, also receive national security briefings from time to time, uh, including, of course, briefings that agencies have provided to various political parties in regard to their operations. I assure the Senate that we take all of those matters seriously and handle them with the seriousness and regard that we should have for them. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. The minister has publicly dismissed allegations by Senator Antic and others about the South Australian Liberal member of the Legislative Council's Jing Li's relationship with China. What is the status of the allegations made by Senator Antic and other South Australian Liberals, and has the matter been referred to relevant authorities? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. My understanding is that, uh, is that relevant party officials uh, had discussions and assured themselves in relation uh, to Ms. Lee uh, that there was no basis, in fact, for the concerns raised. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Um, my question is to the Minister, um, Minister Cash for the uh, Minister for Employment Skills, um, small and family sized businesses. I'm constantly told by businesses, farmers and the hospitality industry, to name a few, that they cannot, let me repeat, cannot get Australians to work. When asked why if they're not taking up employment, people say it's because they are not prepared to lose their job seeker payments or have no fear that they will actually lose their payments. You and I both know they are not under any pressure from your department to take up employment. In other words, you are rewarding people who don't want to work. What do you intend to do to address the problem? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hanson uh, for her question. And, uh, Senator Hanson, you'd know that at the beginning of COVID-19, uh, hundreds of thousands of Australians did lose their jobs. Uh, many of those Australians, and in fact over 400 and uh, almost 450,000, have actually now returned to the workforce uh, as COVID-19 restrictions have been lifted. You'd also be aware, though, that at the outset of COVID-19, because the Australian government had to take the decision uh, to close down parts of our economy. 
economy, uh, we determined that we would also suspend what is called, as you know, mutual obligation. However, as we have seen the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions across Australia uh, and now in relation to Victoria, uh, mutual obligation is now back in place. Uh, you would be aware, Senator Hanson, uh, that on the coalition side uh, of politics, uh, we fundamentally believe in the principle of mutual obligation, and that is, of course, that those receiving benefits or payments should be looking to take up work or alternatively, the opportunity to upskill. Uh, we believe, in fact, we expect uh, those on JobSeeker who are offered suitable employment to accept it. And in fact, we make no apology for encouraging Australians back to work. Uh, Senator Hanson, with the return uh, of mutual obligation, uh, we are now seeing penalties being put in place for those people who are refusing work. Uh, and in fact, in terms of work refusals, 242 work refusal failures for job active seekers have been applied by Services Australia since the 4th of August. We've also seen a total of 250,112 payment suspensions. Uh, so certainly, Senator Hanson, in terms of mutual obligation, uh, that is the mechanism by which you have people, Australians, out there looking for work, and in the event that they say Order, no, Senator Cash. Uh, to Time for the answers expired. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Prior to COVID, 727,000 people were on New Start allowance. Of these unemployed people, 56% were over the age of 45. Of those over the age of 55, 30% have been unemployed for five years or more. And, have, and half of them do not need to meet their mutual obligation to find work. Why and what are you doing about that? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, again, Senator Hanson, um, as you may know, uh, mutual obligation applies uh, to certain categories of person, and there will be exemptions uh, for some people in relation to discharging their mutual obligation requirements. But insofar as COVID-19 uh, has occurred, uh, what we now have back in place is the concept of mutual obligation. Uh, so we do expect job seekers who are out there in, in receipt of the job seeker payment to be looking for work, and in the event that they say no to suitable employment, they can have their payment suspended. But on top of that, Senator Hanson, we've actually put in place uh, additional mechanisms uh, for job seekers to upskill or reskill so that they are able to put themselves forward uh, for a job. And in particular, uh, you'd be aware that we've put in place our $1 billion job trainer agreement. This is specifically about ensuring that as a government, working with the state and territory governments, we are funding areas of vocational education Order. and training. Senator Cash. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Minister, you are going to pay businesses a job maker hiring credit of $200 a week if under 30 and $100 a week if 30 to 35 for 20 hours of work. This means an employer is better off hiring two part-time workers instead of one full-time worker. This program increases our budget deficit, at the same time decreasing job security and encouraging more job casualisation. Is this your intention? Senator Cash. Well, Senator Hanson, I will have to reject uh, the premise of the question that you've just put forward. Uh, well, the answer to it is absolutely no. There are numerous integrity measures uh, in relation to the job maker hiring credit, in particular uh, the 20 hours or more per week. Uh, that the individual is required to work. But on this side of the chamber, we're not going to make any excuses for doing what we can to incentivise employers to take on young people in particular who have been displaced because of COVID-19. It happens to be a fact that we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, it happens to be a fact that the first people to go uh, during a recession are actually young people. And that is why we are putting in place the job maker hiring credit to incentivise employers out there to give a young person a go to get them off welfare and into work. And we on this side of the chamber make no excuses. The best form of welfare is a job. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. 
and it follows very much on the same theme. Can the minister outline how the Liberals and Nationals in government are continuing to support pensioners, families and job seekers in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey for her question. Well, this government is absolutely committed to continuing to provide unprecedented levels of economic yeah. support to Australians who are finding it tough as we work our way through this coronavirus pandemic. And as part of that response, the government's response in the budget, uh, a couple of weeks ago we made an announcement around the provision of two additional payments of $250 uh, as economic support payments to eligible Australians. That will mean 5.1 million Australians will receive these two payments. That's people on the age pension, the disability pension, carers, veterans affairs and some concession card holders. The payments will be made starting on the 30th of November for the first payment and the 1st of March 2021 for the second payment. Um, when you combine this with the two $750 payments that have already been made to this group of people, you will have seen by the 1st of October that more than $12 billion has been paid out to Australians to assist them through this pandemic. That's $2,000 per recipient. Um, but we also have extended the coronavirus supplement um, at, through at extended levels or at enhanced support levels through to until the 31st of December um, as Australians um, and economic confidence continues to build momentum. So from the start of the pandemic to the 1st of October, the government had spent approximately $14 billion on the coronavirus supplement. But we also want to make sure that we help Australians gain meaningful employment, and that remains an absolute priority of this government. So to do so, we have introduced a $300 income-free area, which means that if uh, a person earns up to $300, they will continue to receive the maximum amount of their payment. We want to give people the confidence to get back into the workforce, even if it is only for a day or so a week without affecting their payment. And early data so far has shown the changes that were made on, in September are already starting to work, with mo uh, almost one in five job seekers reporting earning income. Order. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Um, thank you. And can the minister also provide an update to the Senate as to how the government is providing additional incentives to young people to encourage them to take up work in our agricultural and horticultural industries who so desperately need the workers? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, um, Senator Davey, for that really important question. Well, this government absolutely recognises that there is a need for Australia's agricultural sector to find workers, particularly for the upcoming harvest, in, particularly in the horticultural area. In the recent budget, we announced a, a range of temporary measures to incentivise and to boost uh, the participation in these vital industries, but we particularly focused on young people. Young Australians, uh, we want them to take up the opportunity to get out into our regions and take on seasonal work um, because in doing so we have provided added incentive for them to gain independence for the payment of youth allowance, which will subsequently allow them to be able to receive payment when hopefully they start further study or go to university next year. So from the 30th of November this year uh, to the 31st of December next year, young people who earn $15,000 working in the agricultural sector will be considered to be independent for the purposes of youth allowance. We believe this is a significant pathway that shortens the time for people to get independence and helps our horticultural Order, sector. Senator Rustin. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. And how is the government supporting Australian families through changes to the paid parental leave scheme? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I'm pleased to inform the Senate that as part of the budget, um, we have provided support to new parents um, whose employment was interrupted as a result of the coronavirus pandemic by introducing some additional concessional paid parental leave work tests. Um, so under normal rules, parents are required to have worked 10 out of the last 13 months prior to the birth of their child uh, or adoption of their child to qualify for paid parental leave. What we have done is extended that period so that it's 10 out of the last 20 months for births and adoptions, and this will have been in effect from the 22nd of March 2020 until the 31st of March 2021. 
This temporary change um, increases access to paid parental leave for approximately 12,800 families who were previously connected to the workforce but have lost their job as a result of the COVID pandemic and, uh, but would otherwise have been able to qualify. We understand many people have made the decision about family planning prior to COVID and we want to make sure that those families Order, don't Senator miss Rustin. out. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to the Minister for Trade, Senator Birmingham. Senator Canavan has dismissed the impact of the worsening trade relationship with China on the Australian economy and jobs, saying that, and I quote, all we're being asked to do is give up our access to cheap TVs. Is Senator Canavan correct to dismiss the potential impact of this trade dispute on Australian jobs? The Minister for Trade, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, I haven't seen, uh, I haven't seen indeed the uh, the quote attributed to Senator Canavan there, uh, and so I, uh, I I won't take at face value the extract there without seeing the full context of the remarks that uh, that Senator Canavan is likely to have made. As I said before, we do recognise the importance of the trade relationship with China, and indeed I'm happy to uh, happy to give the Senate some of the detail that I took on notice before in relation to Australia's total two-way trade for goods and services export having been valued in 2019 at $251.4 billion, uh, that our goods exports in 2019 were $149.2 billion, that, uh, that over the latest ABS figures, which are for the 18-19 period, there were some 8,184 Australian merchandise exporters uh, engaged in trade uh, with China. And so, uh, indeed, uh, Mr. President, these are important jobs. It's also important that Australia acts at all times to behave consistent with our values and our national interest across all spheres. And so we do that, seeking to absolutely protect our values as a trading nation and our willingness and desire to engage openly and in a rules-based manner to trade with as many nations as possible and for them to reciprocate in doing so. But we also take very seriously the need to protect uh, our critical infrastructure, our communication system, to have foreign investment laws that are appropriate and that, uh, that withstand different strategic challenges that we will face as a nation from time to time. Uh, and it's crucial that as a country uh, we stand strong, clear and consistent in the approaches we take to those types of issues. That's the approach that our government brings and to a steady hand in relation to all aspects of Australia's values and our position, and that is exactly what we will continue to do, whether it be across strategic spheres or Order, economic Senator spheres. Senator Birmingham. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Speaking of steady hands, earlier this year Coalition MP George Christensen set up a website to stoke anti-China sentiment and threatened to summons the Chinese ambassador to answer questions in a parliamentary committee. Has the minister spoken to Mr Christensen about his reckless actions? given the number of jobs dependent on Australia's trade relationship with China? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr Christensen. Uh, Mr President, Mr Christensen is— uh, Apologies, Mr President. Um, Mr Christensen is, uh, is one of many coalition MPs who I have spoken to during the course of this year uh, about Australia's trade and the opportunities in terms of ensuring that we continue uh, to get that perspective right of holding a calm and steady hand in all aspects of our relationship and how we deal with China. This is not a relationship in which we want to see politics played in any sphere. It's not a relationship in which we want to see politics played in any sphere, and nor do we want to see that occur in relation to any, any of our international relationships. And that is crucial right across the board. And it's a message that applies to anybody on all sides of the chamber or the crossbench in that regard, that in relation to our international relationships, it is important that we hold to a firm and steady approach in all of the different aspects of the policies that we have to deal Order, with Senator in the international Birmingham, stage. Senator Watt, final supplementary question. Former Director General of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, Ambassador to the United States and Secretary of the Departments of Foreign Affairs and Trade and Defence, Dennis Richardson, has warned of the impact of gratuitous and inflammatory actions by government members on Australia's relationship with China. Does the minister share his concerns? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. As I said just before, it is my expectation 
uh, that the best approach across this parliament and indeed across our community is for nobody to engage in politically charged or inflammatory approaches in relation to any of our foreign relations. However, it is also important, Mr. President, it is also important, as Senator Payne articulated clearly in her response earlier today, that we are a free speaking democracy with a free media. And in a free speaking democracy with a free media, there will be opinions shared from time to time, points of view made from time to time, with which we will not all agree and with which we may have fundamental disagreements. But the value we place on being able to have those commitments or those statements made is crucial and paramount for indeed our approach as a free-speaking democracy with a free media. And we will defend those rights all of the time, whilst ensuring the government's position in our engagement is Order, always true Senator to those Birmingham. and other values. Senator Askew. Order, Senator Watt. Senator Askew has the call. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. How does the Morrison government's job maker budget build on our record to support infrastructure delivery, create jobs and rebuild our economy following the economic impacts of COVID-19, particularly in regional Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Askew for the question. And certainly, uh, the Morrison government understands that if you invest in infrastructure, you are investing in the creation of jobs. And that's why, through our budget 2020-21, uh, we continue our record investment in infrastructure, job creating, economy boosting infrastructure. Uh, Mr. President, the recent budget also sees additional critical funding uh, for transport infrastructure across all states and territories in Australia. The government's transport infrastructure program has now increased to a new record $110 billion over 10 years from 2020-2021. And Mr President, the new projects that we have announced in the budget, they're expected to support 30,000 direct and indirect jobs over the construction lives of the projects at a time when we know Australia needs job creating policies. Mr President, this further investment uh, it already builds on the significant investment that the Morrison government has already made in infrastructure, with projects already under construction supporting around 100,000 direct and indirect jobs over the life of the projects. Uh, Mr President, our infrastructure program is making a difference right across Australia. We now have more than 60 projects starting construction in the last financial year and more than 50 projects have been completed. But not only that, our investment in our regions extends to every one of the 537 local government areas across the nation. And in fact, the local roads and community infrastructure program delivery benefits to every council, no matter where it is. You invest in infrastructure, Mr. President, as this government continues to do, you invest in jobs for Australians. Senator, I ask you a supplementary question. Thank you. How has the government's accelerated infrastructure spend in response to COVID-19 supported job creation and ec economic recovery, particularly in my home state of Tasmania? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, since the commencement of COVID-19, the government has committed to investing an extra $14 billion in new and accelerated infrastructure projects over the next four years, supporting the creation of around 40,000 jobs. And this includes $1.5 billion being provided for shovel-ready projects uh, and targeted road safety works right across Australia. We're working closely with state and territory governments to rebuild our economy and, of course, to support more jobs being created. Uh, the budget had also provided $2 billion for easy to deliver road safety treatments to be provided to state governments on a use it or lose it basis. This will, of course, ensure that this funding is rolled out quickly and the benefits can flow to communities as soon as possible. And certainly, Senator Askew, in terms of Tasmania, $150 million for the Midway Point Causeway and the Sorrell Causeway in Tasmania. Senator, I ask you a final supplementary question. Great to hear. 
How is the government's infrastructure investment in airports, city deals and aviation supporting a safe reopening to Australia so the economy can recover and create more jobs? Senator Cash. President, the government is investing in the reopening of Australia. And in fact, just this weekend, the government announced a $50 million partnership with the Tasmanian government to upgrade Hobart Airport, which I know is so welcome news to our Tasmanian senators, so that it can take around 30,000 international travellers each week, beginning with three flights a week from New Zealand. And Mr President, it's these types of investments and deals that offer hope to businesses and workers in the airline and tourism industries that have, of course, been devastated by COVID-19. Uh, Mr President, more planes in the sky, of course, means more jobs on the ground for, in this case, Tasmania, uh, but of course, for our entire nation. The new arrangement that we've announced realises the vision set out in, of course, the Hobart City deal. More jobs for Tasmanians is what we are now going to see. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Why is the Australian National Audit Office having to reduce the number of performance audits down from 42 to 40 in the next financial year and then down to 38 in the 2023-24 financial year? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank, uh, I thank the Senator for the question. Uh, I have a, a suspicion, without having gone and checked the Hansard, that the Senator probably explored these questions at some length in, uh, in Senate estimates recently, uh, and indeed that it probably was uh, through that Senate estimates process that, uh, that the Senator uh, secured uh, those figures in terms of the estimated number of audits. Uh, and I would imagine that the ANAO uh, addressed and answered those questions during estimates. If there was anything that was not addressed during the estimates hearings, then I'll bring it back to the chamber. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Wow. Minister for Finance. Before the budget, the Auditor General wrote to the Prime Minister requesting an additional $6.3 million in 2021 in order to deliver 48 performance audits a year. Why did the Prime Minister ignore that request from the ANAO, and did the Prime Minister formally advise the Auditor General why his request had been refused? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President, and, uh, and indeed it seems my suspicions in the first question were uh, were indeed correct uh, that uh, that Senator Gallagher did explore these issues at, at Senate estimates, and that uh, that when asking the Auditor General whether his funding had been cut. He told Senate estimates that there was no change in our budget and forward estimates in the budget process. Asked again, he said there was no change from what we were expecting in our order. budget to Senator what what Wong on a point of order. Point of order, uh, direct relevance. I'm pleased the Senator now has his brief, but the question that was asked was about the Prime Minister's response to a letter to the Prime Minister. And he's being asked this question as the Minister representing the Prime Minister. You reminded the minister of the question, Senator Wong. Uh, I call the minister to continue, noting he has 35 seconds remaining to answer. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Now, it's not unusual, I have to say, for agencies to ask for extra money during the budget process. Uh, I have my, I'm sure, Senator Wong, during her time as uh, as a minister, would have found that agencies frequently ask for additional money during budget processes. Uh, it, is, uh, it is, of course, Mr. President, then uh, a matter during the budget processes to assess that. The ANAO annual appropriations for its left. operating and capital costs Order. continue to go up, Mr. President, Senator each and every year over the forward estimates. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you. As Minister for Finance, I would imagine you'd have an interest in the effectiveness and quality of government spending. But with record government spending over the forward estimates, why is the Morrison government refusing to resource the ANAO so that it can do its job properly? Is it because the Morrison government doesn't like ANAO reports? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, what, we, what we see in, uh, in Senator Gallagher's question there is that, of course, the Labor Party doesn't seem to learn anything over time, that we're accused of starving funding, refusing to provide funding is a starving of funding even though funding is going up each and every year into the future and the budget. So we have a Labor Party here who comes into this chamber and seems to think, seems to think that Order. if an agency just asks for money, they should automatically get the money. 
who seems to say that it's a starving of funding, Order even when that funding goes up. Now, the reality, Mr. President, Order. the reality, Mr. Senator President, Wong, is that we Senator have Gallagher. a Labor Party who haven't learned any of the lessons of the past when it comes to how to say no occasionally, Order. to how to manage the budget in ways. Now, we face the most challenging budget environment in the nation's post-war history. In the nation's post-war history, we are providing record levels of temporary and target assistance to Australia. That doesn't Birmingham. mean that every Time agency the gets a yes to its additional has spending expired. request. Order on my left. Order on my right as well. Senator Wong. Senator Mullen. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my, minister, my question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister update the Senate on the outcomes achieved during her recent visit to key partners in the Indo-Pacific? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Molan for his question and also for his strong and enduring support and commitment to our regional engagements. Uh, and can I also thank the opposition for their support for this uh, very important visit? Uh, last month, I travelled to Japan, Singapore, Brunei, and the Philippines. Uh, to meet in person with my counterparts to discuss shared regional challenges, including our respective COVID-19 responses and also some exciting new opportunities for our bilateral relationships. Uh, all engagements were warm and productive and uh, the visits in person was well, uh, well received. And quite simply, there is no substitute for face-to-face -face meetings, uh, albeit uh, COVID uh, safe. Uh, it was a privilege to be the first defence minister to meet with the J new Japanese defence minister, Minister Kishi. Uh, together, we set the direction for the next phase of our defence cooperation and also uh, new joint uh, activities to address regional challenges. And in Singapore, I met with Prime Minister Lee, Deputy Prime Minister Hung, and my counterpart for defence, uh, Dr. Ng. Together we marked the 30th anniversary, a significant anniversary, of Singapore's military training in Australia, and we acknowledged our shared commitment to a secure and also a prosperous Indo-Pacific region. And we also identified new and quite exciting opportunities for us to train and operate together. And in Brunei, I met with His Majesty the Sultan and the Second Minister of Defence, uh, P. Hin Halbi. We discussed very positive developments this year in our bilateral defence relationship. And we also discussed uh, important regional issues ahead of Brunei's year as the ASEAN chair next year in 2021. And I concluded my visit to the Philippines, where I met again with the Secretary of National Defence, Lorenzana. Uh, we also discussed our respective responses to COVID-19 and the role our militaries were playing, and also looking for new opportunities, which we identified for us to do Order. further work Senator under Reynolds. our enhanced defence cooperation Mullen, program. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister please update the Senate on our input uh, into Exercise Malabar? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. President. Again, I thank Senator Molan for the question. And uh, happily, yes, I can. Uh, whilst in Japan, I was delighted to receive the invitation for Australia to participate in Exercise Malabar. This is a significant opportunity for Australia to enhance its maritime capabilities and also further enhance interoperability with major dem democracies. On 3 November, HMAS Ballarat joined the United States Navy, the Indian Navy and also the Japanese Maritime Self-Defence Force vessels. Australia's participation in Exercise Malabar is a clear demonstration of the Morrison government's commitment uh, to the 2020 Defence Strategic Update. Exercise Malabar itself builds on the strong momentum of our new comprehensive strategic partnership with India and also advances our collective in interests in a free, open and a prosperous Indo-Pacific. Senator Molan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Minister. Can the Minister explain why engagements with regional partners is critical at this time of our complex geostrategic challenges? Senator Reynolds. Oh, look, thank you very much, Mr. President, and again I thank uh, Senator Molan for his question. Our region, without question, is in the midst of the most consequential strategic realignment since the end of World War II. Increasingly, there is an imperative for Australia to actively and also for more assertively advocate for regional security and also stability. Because without security in our region, there is no prosperity. 
Since becoming the Minister for Defence, I've held over 70 bilateral engagements, bilateral and multilateral engagements with international counterparts, and 27 of those have been in person. These regional visits provide an important opportunity to deepen engagement with important partners. And it was very, very clear to me that, like Australia, my regional counterparts want to see a region that is secure, yeah. one that is prosperous, and one where the sovereign interests and the sovereign rights of all states, be they large or small, are respected. And, Mr. President, they all expressed a genuine desire Order. to further Senator deepen Reynolds, their partnerships time for the with Australia. Has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Gary Barnier is the ex-CEO of Opal Aged Care, who allegedly bullied relatives of residents, oversaw a facility where a resident was found with maggots in their mouth, and admitted paying off a man whose blind diabetic mother died because staff failed to act on the advice of doctors and sent her to hospital. Since then, Mr Barnier has been granted $920,000 worth of contracts by the department, one in January and one in October, without tender. When did the minister first become aware of the allegations against Mr Barnier? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Thank you Mr President. Can I say I find it really quite distasteful, the hatchet job that the Labor Party are trying to undertake on Mr Barnier. Uh, Mr Barnier was first employed. Uh, work, well, S S Senator Polly, you should be careful about your comments across the chamber because uh, Mr Barnier was first engaged by Labor in 2013 to first employed, first engaged by the Labor Party to work uh, on forums for the Australian government. And it is really quite disappointing that, Mr. President, that, that the Labor Party come in uh, to the chamber uh, to undertake these sorts of smear campaigns. It really is quite disappointing, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, Ms. Mr. Barnier, as, as Senator Walsh said in her question, was the CEO of Opal Aged Care, uh, and Opal Aged Care, subsequent to the allegations that were being raised, employed the NAUS Group to undertake an independent review of the circumstances that were raised and that independent review Mr President found no made no findings against Mr Barney order made no Senator Colbeck Mr. Senator Barney. Wong on a point of order um, it may be the minister is getting to this but the point of order is direct relevance we asked Senator Walsh asked this minister about his when he first became aware of the allegations against Mr Barnier. that was the question Senator, Senator Wong, there was a, a preface to the question, and I. Point of order, Mr. President. We recognise that there was a, a lead-in, and we have allowed. I have not made uh, taken a point of order for over a minute, recognising that he wanted to get to a whole range of other political issues. But I do remind him of the question. You, and you reminded the minister of the last part of the question. I can't instruct him what part to address as long as he's directly relevant to all or part of it. I, I am listening carefully, and by addressing the claims made in the question, I consider the minister to be directly relevant. So I'll call him to continue, having allowed you to restate part of the question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, um, Mr Barnier is doing uh, some important work specifically related to his particular skills with respect to the, uh, his understanding of the financial structure of the aged care sector. Uh, has supported a number of aged care providers and the government in getting a better understanding of the financial circumstance of the sector more broadly. Uh, uh, it, it is an important piece of work. It is an important piece of work, Mr. President. Senator, Senator Wong, on a point of order. I don't know why the minister is avoiding the question. We're asking when he knew. Direct relevance. Yes, sir, on, on, on direct relevance, the, the question referred to a number of contracts. I am taking that the, the person in question has with the government. The minister is talking about the content of that work uh, that is directly relevant to the question. Senator Colbeck. Mr, Mr. President, uh, what, what the Labor Party is trying to do here is to run a hatchet job on somebody who has, by independent review, been had no findings made against him. Order, Senator. 
Senator Colbeck, Senator Wong. On Mr. The point Mr. Of order. President, this minister appears to be defying standing orders again. I again take a point of order on direct relevance. He was asked a question about his state of mind. He should answer the question. Senator uh, Wong. Question time. Senator Wong, when a question has a substantial preface, all I, 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 in this case not loaded, but mainly assertions of fact, the minister is entitled to address those facts in his answer. Um, shorter questions narrow the definition of direct relevance. The minister is being directly relevant. I cannot instruct him which part of the question nor how to answer the question as long as he remains so. Senator Colbeck, you have seven seconds remaining. Order. Senator Colbeck is on his feet. Order on my left. Senator Colbeck is on his feet. How about you allowing to On my right, Senator Wong. Senator Wong, please. Senator Wong. I'm in no trouble. Mr. Mr. President, no Mr. President, I have no intention of participating in an attempted slur of somebody who's Order. doing good and important Senator Colbeck, Australia. time for the answer has expired. On my left. Senator Wong, I've got your colleague on her feet. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. And no preamble with this question. Did the minister become aware of the widely reported allegations and Mr Barnier's admissions of alleged neglect, bullying and paying off relatives before or after his department handed Mr Barnier a second contract in October this year? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, my understanding is that the, my department, who made the direct appointment of Mr Barnier, was aware of all of the circumstances when they made uh, the appointment in the first, co in the first place uh, for the first contract. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. Why has the minister handed contracts worth $920,000 without tender to someone who admitted to paying off the relative of an aged care resident who died from neglect? How many other contracts has he handed to mates who are completely unfit for their job? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I do note that Mr. Barnier was first appointed by uh, then Minister Collins, as Minister for Aged Care, to work in aged care uh, to support the work that the government, government was doing through the Aged Care Financing Authority. So, Mr. President, uh, uh, the, the assertions, the false assertions that were made uh, in the question, uh, only go to my point about the disgraceful smear that uh, means that uh, Labor are attempting to run on Mr Barnier. Mr President, uh, Mr Barnier is doing some important work relating to the financial structure of the aged care sector, which is an area of his expertise, uh, and I have confidence in the work that he's doing for the government. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Ayres. President, understanding order 745A, I seek an explanation from uh, Minister, uh, the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham, as to why question number 48, uh, which I placed on notice on 2 March 2002, uh, remains unanswered. The question was in relation to the announcement of the Collinsville Feasibility Study. 20 I thought so, Senator. Thank you. you haven't been here that long, Senator. I approach yes. the sort of technical aspects of the standing orders with some trepidation. Subject matter, I'm very comfortable with. But Senator, Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, convention certainly is uh, is that if uh, if a question on these matters is to be raised at the conclusion of question time, notice is usually given. I am not aware that notice has been given to my office in relation to. Um, uh, following up on this question, uh, I am happy outside of the chamber to seek to follow up for uh, for the senator, Madam Deputy President. But uh, I regret that I am not in a position to be able to give him an explanation at this time. Oh, sorry, Senator. Okay, please continue, Senator. Ayres. Sorry, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, understanding Order 745B, I move that the Senate take note of the explanation provided to the extent that it was provided at all. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, the question on notice that I provided uh, earlier this year was in relation to the Collinsville coal catastrophe, uh, the announcement that the government made 
uh, in early 2019. You couldn't conceive of a plan that could more effectively take more than a decade, be very, very expensive, push the price of power up, increase Australia's emissions with an enormous subsidy in terms of borrowed billions of taxpayer dollars and an announcement that would more effectively hold Australian industry back and hold Australian energy providers back. How could the party of free enterprise sink so low? Now, Senator Canavan, who was the principal advocate for this hopeless boondoggle, uh, was very active last year uh, around Queensland and very active in this place this year, making the case for an enormous expenditure of taxpayer money on an inefficient, uh, on an inefficient uh, energy provider, an inefficient generator. How has, how has the Liberal and National Party sunk so low that they would be investing taxpayer dollars in even a feasibility study? How has Senator Canavan wandered so far away from the principles of the Liberal and National Party? How has he got so lost? He came in here, Senator Canavan, with such promise. He got good marks at university. And while he may have been a teenage Trotskyite, he reformed over time. He got a job at KPMG and then at the Productivity Commission and then worked as a political staffer year after year. It's the perfect pedigree for a Liberal and National Party politician. School, university, corporate sector, public service, ideally in a job promoting uh, far-right neoliberal ideology, political staffer, then parliament. Senator Canavan had a privileged rails run into this place. Well, how did it all go so wrong? Senator Canavan is here in Canberra advocating for state socialism for inefficient, high emissions, coal-fired power, but he's all Margaret Thatcher when it comes to casually employed coal miners. He's for big taxpayer funds and subsidies for our big energy companies, but he's got nothing to say to those thousands of Queensland coal miners who are on labour hire, casually employed, can't get a decent job, can't secure a mortgage. When it comes to labour hire, Senator Canavan's on the side of big industry and the bosses. Uh, and when it comes to uh, big government subsidies, he is nowhere to be seen when it's working people's interests, but he's up there at the board table, uh, sucking up to the big boards, sucking up to the big energy companies, providing support for some of the dopiest policy prescriptions in energy policy that you could imagine. He has got it so wrong. It's a policy position that would ultimately hurt the people of regional Australia more than anybody else. But the problem is, as Senator Canavan repeatedly tells us, that he's had the ear of the Prime Minister on this mad set of propositions. We know that Senator Canavan had the Prime Minister's ear on these subjects because he told everybody in the building that he did. Every journalist that he could tell, he told that this Collinsville coal-fired power station, this giant boondoggle that would employ almost nobody, that will never in fact be built, that this great facility was going to be built. Storming around the corridors of Parliament House here with a giant imaginary boondoggle, you might as well shovel $8 billion of borrowed money into the sea as build this imaginary, this imaginary power station. If you did build it, this imaginary power station, this hoax on the people of regional Queensland, the product would be prices up, 
The product of that would be emissions up. The product of that would be debt up. Even Donald Trump, even President Trump, wouldn't back a project as silly as this one. Uh, and that's why it's so important to know. That's why it's vital uh, that questions on notice, when they are provided, are answered. And of course, we know the real reason why Senator Cormann, uh, as the leader of the government in the Senate, and now Senator Birmingham, haven't provided an answer to that question. Well, the real reason is because it's a deeply embarrassing sequence of events for a government that's supposed to be that's supposed to be a responsible government that's supposed to be acting in the interests of all Australians that's supposed to have a plan for our energy future and despite everything that we've heard and despite all of the soft words and despite all of the attempts at characterizing the position we know what's really going on Emissions are continuing to increase. Prices are continuing to increase. Uh, we are nowhere near on track for an energy plan that can uh, credibly reduce Australia's emissions, nowhere near on track for a plan that's going to secure jobs uh, in our regions. Uh, and we are in the position of having a government that is now an outlier in international affairs on emissions policy. And the government, unable to move because of this rabble on their backbench, who lack all credibility uh, in the rest of Australia, they are in, in uh, an incredibly influential position, bullying Senator Birmingham, bullying the Prime Minister, getting their way in the caucus and driving Australia to a less and less credible position around the world. Uh, it is absolutely in Australia's interests and the interests of Australian industry and Australian jobs that we have a credible pathway on energy policy. Instead, we've had 22 energy policies from a government that can't deliver a coherent approach. Uh, one day it's pointing one day it's pointing in the direction of Bolsonaro in Brazil. Uh, one day it's sucking up to the, the approach to climate policy from uh, President Trump. Uh, every day is a new day when it comes to coalition energy policy. By contrast, we've seen quite some development in industry and quite some development around the country and the states and territories. I look forward to learning a little bit more about what the Berejiklian government has announced in New South Wales—$32 billion worth of investment, they say, in replacing the coal-fired power generators in New South Wales that will drive down costs, that will drive down emissions. Uh, if it's done properly, it will deliver, it will deliver lower price power more manufacturing, more jobs for regional New South Wales. As I say, I look forward to seeing the detail of that set of policy propositions. It fits very neatly with what the Leader of the Opposition announced in his budget reply speech just some weeks ago in this place. The $10 billion Rewiring the Nation program announced by the member for Graindler, Anthony Albanese, is a clear signal of where the Labor Party is pointed, where future policy making in this area is pointed, wherefore the technologies that reduce price and reduce emissions and don't hold Australian industry and the Australian energy sector back. Senator Canavan uh, and his mates over there on the coalition backbench Remember, he was, used to be quite influential in the show as a former minister, but Senator Canavan is for dragging the country backwards, for lifting energy prices, for lifting Australian emissions, for making it harder, for clean energy investments 
that would lower prices and lower emissions and provide jobs for ordinary Australians, everyday Australians in regional towns, in, in, in suburbs across Australia, in manufacturing businesses. That is the main game, but the coalition government has gone entirely missing on these questions, uh, and it is high time that uh, Senator Birmingham signalled a change in approach uh, in terms of accountability and ministerial accountability in this place from what we've seen over the course of the last few years and I've seen over the course of the last 18 months. That is a stoic refusal to answer questions, a stoic refusal to, re to provide timely responses to questions on notice and a stoic refusal to effectively uh, discharge the, uh, the responsibilities of ministers in this parliament. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Eyre. If there are no other contributions, I'll put the question. So the question is that um, the motion to take note uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Ayres. Again, Acting, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's, um, I think somebody decided that I needed some um, exercise today. Um, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Birmingham and Payne to the questions asked by myself and Senator Watt. Uh, I thought that today's question time was pretty instructive. Um, the strongest indication, I think, when Senator Birmingham had an opportunity to signal a change in direction and an effort uh, under his leadership to respond effectively to these questions of national interest. Uh, and I'm disappointed to see uh, that the new leader in this place failed that test. It should have been a pretty easy test, really. On one side, there's a national interest, and on the other side, there's the partisan interest. It's manifestly in the national interest to call out the conduct of Senator Abetz. It's manifestly in the national interest to call out the conduct of Senators Canavan Christensen and Kelly in relation to their wild and unhelpful and reckless comments uh, in relation to the whole host of issues that go to our relationship with China. But so weak is Senator Birmingham's grip uh, on the coalition caucus, so shallow his commitment uh, to principle and to the national interest that he squibbed it. Australians of Chinese descent will be watching very closely, and what they will see is that for all of the fundraising dinners, all of the nice words, all of the grooming of members of the Chinese Australian community, when push comes to shove, the Liberals and Nationals will never stand for the Chinese Australian community, not even when it's easy, not even when it's straightforward. It should be straightforward. What we heard was Minister Payne in here exhorting people in the Senate, other senators, to follow her example that the most important principle here was freedom of speech, where well, there are other principles that matter too. Principles of responsibility, principles of leadership, principles of not being reckless when it comes to the national interest. I thought that what Senator Payne said came very, very close to what we remember Senator Brandis saying, that everyone's got a right to be a bigot. Well, people in this place have responsibilities. I say that Senator Abetz was wrong in his approach uh, on the Foreign Affairs Committee for three reasons. One is it was morally rep reprehensible. Secondly, what Senator Abetz said reinforces the Chinese Communist Party line that they are delivering uh, to people of Chinese descent all around the world and in Australia. And thirdly, it reinforces the Chinese Communist Party's government's propaganda line within China. There is an important distinction here. I don't say that Senator Abetz is a racist. I disagree strongly with Senator Abetz. I don't see him that way. But his conduct here is the result of assumptions that are driven by views about race. 
What he asked those three witnesses to do was to unconditionally condemn the Chinese Communist Party dictatorship, despite its McCarthyist overtones. But at least, at least Joe McCarthy asked everyone the same question. Senator Abetz only asked those witnesses, nobody else. They came with a genuine submission to this diaspora inquiry, talking about the issues of interference, the issues of dislocation, asking for a safe space for debate, support for their engagement, but they had the door slammed in their face. Just when they were asking for tolerance and inclusion, they got the cold shoulder. Secondly, what Senator Abetz said reinforces the propaganda line that is taken by the government in China to Australians of Chinese descent. They say you will never be accepted here. Now We know this isn't true. We know that since the gold rush, Chinese Australians have been a core part of the Australian story. But Senator Abetz sent the opposite message. People of good faith, seeking inclusion, were given the cold shoulder. And finally, sadly, Senator Abetz's message reinforced it was a propaganda victory for the Chinese government in the context of the difficult issues that we face Thank you, in Senator our relationship Ayers, your today. Time has expired, Senator Stoker. There's an enormous immaturity on display in the way that we have heard Labor talk about Australia's relationship with both China and Australians of Chinese descent in question time today and in the, the froth and bubble of Senator Ayres' contribution just a moment ago. Because while in question time they started out by um, demanding apologies, the, you know, the politics of condemnation, by finding a one-liner from a member of um, the government with which they disagree and trying to make that into something um, that can be extrapolated into itself being um, the, the source of jeopardy for the relationship between our two countries, demanding that there be such a grovelling approach that uh, one cannot even um, exercise one's right to speak in the way that Senator Abetz has, then in their third question they've gone on the offensive on the question of foreign interference in a way that reflects that very insensitivity of which they accuse Senator Abetz. And I've got to say, that reflects an awfully shallow understanding of the significance of um, the relationship between our two important countries. But let me, let me say this at the outset, because those opposite build their arguments um, when it comes to the relationship between Australia and China on what is um, fundamentally an underestimation of uh, the impressive and strong community of Australians of Chinese descent that we have in this country. Australians of Chinese descent are valued members of the Australian community. They're avid entrepreneurs. They are champions of family business. They are people who value family. And they value the freedoms we have in this country for many of them because the very reason they value it is because they don't have that privilege in the country from which they came. When I go around um, in my home state of Queensland and talk to Australians of Chinese descent, they are so thankful, so thankful for the freedoms that we have here, freedoms from many of um, the most abhorrent practices that um, we all know but often don't want to talk about happening in, in other countries, including in China. And they say thank you for a government that is prepared to ensure that they are not the subject of intimidation. They are thankful for a government that is prepared to protect those from the diaspora, diaspora who have made Australia home who want to live by Australian values. And can I tell you, I'm so proud of those Chinese Australians. They are wonderful contributors to this country. But let's not reduce what is a really very serious issue, and that is the maintenance of an effective trading relationship 
in the interests of the ability of Australian producers through many industries, but particularly in agriculture, to something that is a glib one-liner. We need to stand true to Australia's values, always. And you know what? This government has made it very clear from the words of the Prime Minister that Australia will always stand by our sovereignty. Australia will always stand by our values. We will always be consistent with those and we will never trade them away. We will maintain our integrity, whether it's in our foreign investment rules or our rules about interference in Australia's political situations or about the integrity of our communications networks and all of those things. You know what? China does exactly the same thing. They protect their integrity of their systems according to their values and they do it unapologetically. Australia does the same because we act in the interests of Australians today, tomorrow and every day of the week. And we won't apologise for that. We'll fight for it every day in the interests of the beef producer in Longreach, Queensland, as much as in the interests of um, the Australian baby formula exporter, as much as in the interests of the Australian iron ore producer. And that is the honest, subtle truth of it. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I think all Australians are watching with increasing dismay the escalation of what seems to be a serious trade dispute between Australia and China. Every day we see increasing reports of restrictions from China on imports of Australian beef, barley, wine, coal, sugar and other products. Now, this, these bans and these restrictions have particular significance in my home state of Queensland, uh, given the volume of exports uh, from Queensland to China and the number of jobs that hang off those exports. To give you some sense of this, I just want to quickly quote from a report issued recently uh, by Queensland economist Gene Tunney. Uh, he, he observes that Queensland is obviously heavily exposed to trade restrictions from China. Queensland's annual goods exports to China of circa $25 billion amount to around 7 per cent of our gross state product. Ongoing trade restrictions from China would cause major economic damage, especially in our regional economies, such as central Queensland and Mackay, which are highly dependent on resources and agriculture. And in the lead up to the 2021 Queensland budget, which Treasur Queensland Treasurer Cameron Dick will hand down on the 1st of December, I should note that Chinese trade restrictions would be a big blow to our budget via impacts on royalties and other revenues such as payroll tax and stamp duty, which would be lower due to the economic shock. Sure, our exporters may be able to find alternative markets in which to sell, but that will take time, and they have to heavily discount their products to find non-Chinese buyers. So this trade dispute is not just an academic exercise in my home state of Queensland. As uh, Dr Tunney observes, this has very real impacts on Queensland's exports, on Queensland jobs and on royalties that pay for services right around Queensland, in particular in regional econom economies such as central Queensland and Mackay. And that's why I have been so concerned to see some of the inflammatory rhetoric coming out of LNP members of parliament and senators from Queensland. You would think that if anyone was passionate about making sure that Queensland jobs are protected, that Queensland exports grow rather than shrink, it would be representatives in this chamber and in this parliament from Queensland. Now, I am not for a moment saying that we should be quiet about our concerns, about our national interest or about our values in relation to China or any other country. Uh, we should always speak up about our national interests. We should always protect our values. But this has to be done responsibly and maturely. As those figures that I've just pointed to demonstrate, there is too much on the line for reckless and inflammatory rhetoric. The responsible and mature approach is the approach that Labor has taken. We have consistently spoken up about concerns that we have regarding the human rights approach of China, around national security issues, around defence issues as well. 
And even just in the last few days, we have uh, expressed our concern about the escalating trade dispute with China. And we've expressed our concern about what this might mean for Australian exporters and for Australian jobs. It is one thing to speak up responsibly and maturely about our values, about our national interests, uh, about our defence concerns. It is another thing entirely to engage in the reckless and inflammatory rhetoric that we are increasingly seeing from members of this government, because that is not going to help. That is not going to do anything to advance our national interests. It is not going to do anything to advance our values, and it is certainly not going to do anything to protect Queensland jobs and Queensland exports. So that's why you've got to ask the question why members of parliament like the member for Dawson, Mr Christensen, go out there saying in relation to the COVID-19 virus that the CCCP knowingly and deliberately allowed these ambassadors of death to infect the rest of the world. Is that advancing our national interests in a mature and responsible fashion? Or is that just recklessly going out, inflaming tensions which have a practical consequence on Queensland jobs and Queensland exports? Similarly, Senator Canavan has recently said, if China buys less of our coal, that means we will have some to build our own our new Healy coal plants in Australia. Uh, and he's also gone on to say that all we're being asked to do is to give up our access to cheap TVs. This is actually a serious issue. This is a serious issue that deserves to be taken on responsibly and maturely. It doesn't deserve to be used as a way of generating Facebook likes, which put Queensland jobs at risk. Thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Antip. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, Madam Deputy President, we have heard um, uh, conflations of uh, words today, this afternoon, in, uh, in question time and after, which do raise concerns from this side of the chamber. Uh, we've heard words bandied around, such as McCarthyism and uh, recklessness. Uh, I'd put it uh, to the chamber, uh, Madam Deputy President, that in fact uh, recklessness is conflating this issue into something that it is not. The the uh, fact of the matter is that China is our largest trading partner, and it is likely to remain so uh, into the foreseeable future. And that's because trade has brought mutual benefits and lifted hundreds of millions of people uh, out of the region, out of poverty. And as we emerge from this particularly difficult time in the COVID-19 pandemic, it's important that trade continues to be open, transparent and uh, useful as a tool to economic recovery. The Australian government has, through its embassy in Beijing and its agencies in Canberra, sought to clarify media reports of restrictions and unsubstantiated reports of possible bans on Australian products. And such reports, if true, would raise serious questions about compliance with trade rules, uh, and which would be inconsistent with statements from the Chinese leadership, including last week's China International Import Expo on its commitment to open trade and the multilateral uh, trading system. So we and this government expect that China will continue its trade relationship with Australia in a manner consistent with its obligations. Chinese authorities have uh, confirmed increased testing of Australian live lobster, live lobster imports, on which the Australian government had been urgently seeking clarification. Australia has strong regulatory controls that underpin the biosecurity, integrity and safety of our exports, safeguards that support our international reputation as a reliable exporter of safe, high-quality produce. The Australian government continues to expand trade opportunities for exporters, most recently through the CP, uh, CPTPP and trade agreements with Indonesia, Peru, um, Hong Kong. Uh, the PACER Plus will enter into force next month and we will expect to sign the regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement before the end of this year, as well as negotiating trade agreements with the EU, UK and the Pacific uh, Alliance. And so the issue regarding the number of our commodities and other exports is, of course, uh, a great concern to the government and a great concern to those exporters. And the Australian government has been standing by our exporters ways, sorry, in ways this country has not seen in a long time, particularly during this difficult time of the pandemic. The technical issues, as they have been described by the Chinese government, will now be worked through. But as the Prime Minister has said, Australia will stand by our sovereignty. We will always stand by our values. We will always be consistent with those, and we will never trade them away. 
and we will maintain the integrity of whether it's foreign investment rules or rules of interference in Australia's political uh, situations here in Australia or the integrity of communications network, whether it be all of these things. And we will continue to raise our voice on matters that are important to the Australian people. And we'll do that consistently so that these things can't be traded away. And there are matters of concern. They are matters of concern which the Australian government has raised over and over again, and we'll continue to do so um, so that we may stand by our uh, values. Now, as the Prime Minister has said, it is critical that we work this relationship, uh, importantly for Australia, in a way that's consistent with the comprehensive strategic partnership. It's an important partnership. We believe it's an important relationship, but it's a relationship that will always be based on Australia's national interests and mutual benefit between Australia and China. These deeply troubling rumours about trade relations um, uh, and categories which are predominantly, as the Trade Minister has said, predominantly rumours which are unconfirmed, unsubstantiated and people need to treat them in the manner in which they have been um, described. And it is important, of course, for our exporters that we do give them all the support that they require through these difficult times in terms of their engagement with the Chinese authorities and their business counterparts uh, on mainland China and uh, other parts of the Chinese, um, including uh, Hong Kong and other. The, important, the, the, the importers and customers who have had such a huge demand. Thank you, Senator Antic. The time has expired. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And I think we know who won the battle in here. Senator Birmingham clearly won the battle. He sends uh, Senator Antic. He gives him a slap down in terms of his answer to the question in Parliament today and then sends him out to take note here. Uh, and what we do know is that this is a very serious issue that Australians are anxious about, um, and it is something that is going to be of real consequence for Australian workers and, as Senator Watts said, Queensland workers. Uh, and there is increasing anxiousness amongst Australians about the mismanagement of this important relationship. So many businesses have geared up over time uh, to do trade with China, uh, and that is being put at risk because of the mismanagement of this government. And there has been a lack of action from this government to actually fix up this relationship. There's been zero leadership from responsible ministers, and they've outsourced the relationship to the backbench. And that has had real consequences for Australians. Uh, and there's no better example of that than uh, the work that the member for Dawson, George Christensen, and Senator Canavan have been doing this year that has undermined that relationship with China. Uh, and it is having a real impact on Australian workers. And I just wanted to take point with Senator Stoker's contribution where Senator accused us of immaturity. Uh, we are the ones who are actually treating this seriously because we know how significant this is. It's the government backbenchers, the ones that are causing the trouble, um, that are actually putting this relationship at risk and doing further damage. And I thought it was, it was uh, rather astounding that the leader of the government in the Senate, Senator Birmingham, said he was a steady hand on this issue. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. And I think if you look at the industries that are being impacted, they would say nothing other than he has been a dead hand on this issue because he is actually not taking this up to the government, to uh, fixing these issues and being able to be in a leadership position to take advantage of that. Um, so last year, China accounted for uh, uh, significant proportion of our exports, uh, and that included barley, Queensland timber, wine, lobster, sugar, coal, copper and meat. Uh, and these are some of the biggest employers uh, that Queensland have and have been such a significant part uh, of the export industry that we have seen develop over time. Uh, but already we are seeing that this is having consequences across Australia and particular in Queensland. Uh, just on the radio last week, I heard the CEO of Cirame Wines, which is uh, an iconic brand in Queensland and a place, uh, particularly in Brisbane, that many people are aware of. And they've been exporting 40 per cent of their wine to China. Uh, and that is being put at risk because of this mismanagement of this relationship um, of this government. Uh, we also know there's been reports in Mackay 
of the volume exported through the Hay Point terminal, uh, coal terminal in Mackay, has been declining uh, this year again. It puts jobs at risk. It puts economic uh, development at risk as well. Uh, so business is rattled. Uh, they have been looking for leadership from the government that has been so far found wanting. Uh, workers are getting anxious, so we know that they are following these developments. They know that these sorts of repercussions have a direct impact on them and their livelihoods and for their family. And the government is rudderless on this issue. Uh, you only have to look at the quote uh, from Minister Birmingham uh, in The Australian uh, from a couple of days ago, where he said, Continued uncertain and inc inconsistent messages from China are heightening risks and undermining the statements made by President Xi at this year's China's Inter International Expo, Expo, Senator Birmingham said. So he's saying that it's China's uncertain and inconsistent messages that are having an impact. Well, what about the inconsistent and uncertain messages from the government and their backbench? Um, because that is what is having an impact on this relationship. And it is something that is increasingly causing anxiousness uh, and, uh, uh, amongst employers and businesses, but also workers as well. So there's no doubt that the performance from uh, Minister Birmingham today, uh, for those who were able to see it, would not fill Australians with confidence. Uh, Australians understand the importance of this relationship. Uh, it is a complex one, but it is an important one that we get right. So far, the government have completely mismanaged it. And under questions from uh, the opposition today, uh, you would have no confidence that they are going to be able to fix this relationship, uh, and one that is such an important one for Australian businesses and Australian workers. Uh, and it is important um, that the government show leadership on this issue and actually uh, come to Thank you, the Senator Australians Chisholm. on this. Your time has expired. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Ayres to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answers uh, given by uh, Senator Birmingham to the question that I asked uh, about climate ambition and targets, noting uh, the president-elect in the U.S. Biden has committed to 100% clean electricity by 2035, and has also rightly noted that the climate emergency is an existential threat. Um, upon which we have no time to lose. Now, I put those statements to the, the new leader of the government in this, in this chamber, and I pointed out that now uh, we're essentially friendless, uh, and the only friends we do have in the climate arena internationally are petrostates like Saudi Arabia and Russia, um, and Brazil for that matter. So, really, this is an opportunity for this government to rethink its pathetically low 2030 targets. It's an opportunity for the opposition to uh, decide upon its 2030 targets and announce that. Um, we have a clear signal of a change of direction from one of the most influential uh, global actors in this space. This is a perfect opportunity for a reframe. Unfortunately, we didn't hear any of that evidence today. In fact, we heard uh, more of the same sort of self-congratulatory gumph that we've come to expect from this climate-denying government. Um, and indeed, uh, we, they trotted out that old trope that we uh, meet, meet and beat our Kyoto 1 targets. Now, I hope people remember that, in fact, our commitment under Kyoto 1 was an increase on our emissions of 8 per cent. So I'm afraid I'm not terribly impressed that we managed to increase our emissions by 8 per cent, and that certainly should not be trumpeted as some uh, great achievement by this nation. We then heard the same old trope that uh, we're going to do OK on our second round of targets, not mentioning that that's because we are using carryover credits, which most other countries have said they will voluntarily not use. So again, the absolute spin from this government on climate doesn't fool anyone that's paying attention. And they know how close this government is to the coal and gas and oil sector. They know how much money flows in political donations, uh, frankly, to both sides of politics. And they know uh, just how weak this government is on climate. Um, I pointed out that, in fact, the government's pathetic targets have us on track for four degrees of warming in Australia, that the um, CSIRO and the bomb have confirmed um, will have devastating impacts on this nation. We have had a terrible year, but people won't forget that it started off with the worst 
uh, worst uh, historically destructive bushfires that this nation has ever seen. The climate crisis hasn't gone away just because we've been in a health crisis um, and a deepening economic crisis. It's still there. And the good news is we can fight our way out of the health crisis and the economic crisis by taking action on the climate crisis, by actually investing in publicly owned clean renewable energy. It will create jobs. It could uh, start off our public manufacturing domestic sector again. We can, uh, I shouldn't say kill two birds with one stone, I'll get cranky emails about that, but we can achieve multiple goals with sensible policies that aren't simply in hoc to big oil, big coal and big gas. Um, but sadly, Senator Birmingham didn't even answer my question about whether the government would lift Australia's targets for 2030 at the next climate summit. That was the expectation in Paris, that people would make an initial commitment and they would come back and revisit that, that target with an, with an intention to increase it, an encouragement to increase it. We got no such indication at all out of this government. I then mentioned um, uh, that the commitment to 100 per cent clean energy by 2035 by the president-elect uh, was something that Australia really could consider fo following suit on. Now, the Greens think that we could get there in Australia by 2030. We think the technology is there for that transition to be able to be done in a way that leaves no one behind and, in fact, reduces power prices. But we didn't get an answer on that either. Um, we got some lecture about how the roadmap is, is apparently consistent, which it is flagrantly not. Um, and the last part of my question was, I mentioned that former Prime Minister uh, Malcolm Turnbull described on the weekend the government's gas-led recovery as BS and political piffle. Well, uh, I thought that was somewhat awkward for that side of politics, but again, we got the general waffle about how bloody great gas is. And there was a, an assertion made by Senator Birmingham that our emissions are reducing, completely glossing over the fact that gas emissions have skyrocketed. And we know from previous studies gas is virtually as dirty as coal when it comes to the climate. We do not need a gas-led recovery. That is a nonsense. What we need is strong investment in clean energy and things like public housing and schools and hospitals to tackle the climate crisis and create jobs. But we're not seeing that Thank from this you, government, Senator Waters. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Waters, to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.